This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Yo, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Another great week, another great week talking smallmouth fishing. Of course, we got 52 of the top smallmouth bass anglers in the country spilling the juice, laying it all on the line to help you catch more smallmouth. That's the whole goal of this podcast. We're also going to be broadcasting this on my YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. And we got a great guest tonight. He knows how to catch some fish from upstate New York, one of my favorite places in the country to smallmouth fish. I'm really looking forward to this one. Before we get into that, let's talk about the real shot. Real shots quickly becoming the go-to shop for bass anglers across the country. Why? Because they got everything. Evergreen, me- mega bass, whatever you want. It's there. Lucky craft. I don't know. They got the standard stuff too. VMC, Berkeley, Rapala. Huge selection. Their website, therealshot.com. And if you use my promo code, smallmouthcrush15, you get 15% off your order, which is a pretty big deal. I'd take advantage of that if I were you. It's all going to be the show notes if you want to check out The Real Shot after this podcast. Well, without further ado, let's bring our next guest on, this week's guest, Casey Smith. And just like that, he pops up on the screen. How are you doing, man? What up? What up? <laughs> oh, well. A lot going on this year. Crazy year, dude. It's a it is. step back for me this year with COVID changing the schedule. I, I took a step back and stayed a little bit more local, but worked out all right. I hope next year's back back to normal. I hope so. I mean, you, you've you fished the FLW Opens. You've had a lot of success, some big wins. Uh, Potomac River, largemouth guy too, I guess you are. I, dude, I, I don't you do largemouth. I don't know. They're sneaking back on my top of my list here lately you're, i don't know what's starting going to on like with that them. i'm starting to like them you like the finger lakes i think we're gonna have to dig into the finger lakes with you i know you're a i think you won a pretty good event on cayuga this year i know you won a lot of tournaments there in the past but if you could just give us a, a brief background about yourself where you're living now i know you're in upstate new york and uh i'm gonna start drilling you with some hardcore smallmouth questions in a little bit all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm Rochester, New York area. I'm on the east side of it. So I'm kind of right in the middle of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario on the south shore or uh, sorry, Lake Erie and Lake Oneida and uh, right on the south shore of Ontario. I live probably 10 minutes from the shore of Ontario, but the south, the south shore kind of sucks. It's not like the eastern basin or anything, but lived here my whole life and just my dad grew up tournament fishing. I've always tournament fished, had a bass boat basically as long as I can remember and just, just what I like to do. So Rochester, how do you decide which direction to hook your boat up and go on any given day? There's a lot of choices, man. We got a lot of choices. It's all about the mood and what you want to do. If you're feeling like largemouth, you go to the largemouth hole. If you feel like catching smallmouth shallow, you go, here, if you want to catch them deep, you go there. If you want to drag a tube, you go to Erie. It's that's the best part about it. Is you can literally do anything. If you watch a pro tournament, you know, live coverage and they're doing something that you want to go do, you just go to a lake where you can do that and scratch the itch. That's the best part. Right. So I know the Finger Lakes are are close to you. You mentioned the south shore of Ontario, uh, an area I don't have a whole lot of experience. I, I imagine there's a few fish still swimming around there. Uh, when you want to go for a quick trip, is that a place you head to? Yeah, they're here. I mean, I, I can bounce up on a weeknight if it's calm and, and it's nice weather. I can bounce up on a weeknight and hit a boat ramp that's 15, 20 minutes from the house. And you can go up there and catch fish. I mean, guys, we run tournaments out of the small bays like Sodus Bay and Fairhaven Bay all the time. Local, you know, 15, 20 boat tournaments. And it takes 22, 23, 24 pounds of wind all the time. But mm. If you go up north and catch that in the St. Lawrence or catch that in Ontario, more times than not, you're catching quite a few fish to catch it. Yeah. 
and here you're you know you're catching six or eight ten in a day i mean you go out and have big days numbers wise um especially if you go somewhere like oswego you can catch a lot more fish but right here kind of in this rochester area the, i don't know the 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 structure is not there. It's just straight okay. contours for miles on end. It takes if you want to go from twenty it's feet. It's hard bottom feet, still, or it's hard bottom. Yeah, it's just it's just that slate rock everywhere okay. where it's it's not those good, you know, broken rock or rock veins, and not many good boulders and stuff like that. How's the water clarity on the south end of Ontario? It's about the same as up north. Same. Is it okay? Yeah, it's about the same. Sure. So I imagine you get on Erie a little bit. That's not too far from you, the the eastern basin of the Buffalo. Yeah, we go to Erie. We love Erie in the spring and fall, and um, they don't have many of the big tournaments up there, so we don't spend much time in the summer. But spring and fall is a riot, so we we spend a bunch of time up there every every spring and fall. How soon can you get out there in the spring and catch a fish? It depends on the ice boom. If you can, as soon as you can get out you can catch fish and as okay. late as you can go in the fall you can catch fish but they boom the river off so that i don't know if it's so ice doesn't flow over the, the falls or what they do but they boom it off what does that mean boom it's a huge barricade that they put across the mouth of the niagara river so the ice doesn't flow down it really it's, it's like a huge fence and they just okay. put it they string it from the u.s yeah. side to the canadian side Okay. And it literally blocks the river so the ice won't flow down it and it just makes a huge log jam of ice. So the problem in the spring is if they don't take the boom out, even if it's warm enough for the ice to break up and the ice to go away, a west wind pushes any ice that's out there, even if it's on the Canadian side, it push it all down in the mouth of the river and it just makes a huge log jam. You can't get out there. So sure. But uh, I think it was this past spring they took it out really early or it got I think it broke is what happened. The, the the uh the thing broke and all the ice went down the river and it was like flowing over the sides and flowing on the sidewalks and the streets <laughs> but we got to get out fishing earlier <laughs> yeah right i mean with all these places that you you can choose from on any given day you know what was your favorite place to fish for smallmouth uh you know where would it be if you could if you could just if you had to pick one lake one region what would that region be I mean, the region is here for sure. Uh, anywhere in New York, I, I literally go back and forth on what my favorite place is by the year. I mean, there was one year when I just went to Erie about a hundred times because it was so much fun. And then I got tired of just dragging a tube around. And um, I used to love to fish Oneida and uh, fish offshore. And I was catching them on a football jig all the time. And Kind of got tired of that and then went hmm. somewhere else and figured out how to catch them there. I would I would say, um, even though I don't fish it all the time, Champlain is probably one of my favorites. I fish less there than anywhere else because it's pretty far from my house, relatively speaking. But uh, I like Champlain. I like Oneida. Um, Eastern Basin of Ontario, definitely. Especially like Chameau and Henderson where it's... It's not that true Great Lakes fishing. It's a little bit more of the Champlain and Oneida style where you, you can power fish a little more. I like that a lot. Okay. So power fishing is kind of your, your deal. I mean, yeah. your preferred way to catch smallmouth. Uh, I would say that's changing for a long time. It definitely was. I loved, you know, throwing a swim bait or a jerk bait or an umbrella rig. I would pick that any day over drop shot and net rigging, but I'm slow. I was talking to a buddy of mine a couple weeks ago and I said, dude, I caught a lot of bass this year on a spinning rod. And, um, I'm definitely changing. It's something addicting about that bite with that, you know, like a seven foot medium action rod. That's just so light. And when they bite it and you know, he's on there and you can set the hook and he just, the rod just bowed straight over and it, you sure. got to wait for his head to surge to know that it's a bass and not the bottom. Mm -hmm. I get in just more and more addicted to that every time. Sure. Where do you think the best smallmouth is located? Uh, in the country. In the country. In the country, upstate New York, 110%. You can't convince me otherwise. What body of water? Lake Ontario or Erie? Um, I think right now Erie's better than Ontario, but I think right now the river is better than Ontario. St. Lawrence River is better than Ontario. I think there's something going on in the lake. I think the charter boats need to be addressed. 
Mm. Um, I think the season needs to be addressed, which I I read recently that Canada adjusted their season. Yeah, I, I think I all those look, things got to happen. I didn't look too closely into it, but it sounds like there's a open season now for bass fishing in Canadian waters with a small close season during the prime spawning times. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, I think the early open season that starts in, I don't know if it was April or May, I think it's catch and release only, mm -hmm. which we have here, which before and in that region of New York, you can't even go out and target bass. Right. Um, here where I live in this region, you can, you can go out and fish for them all you want. You just can't keep them. So the way yeah. I read it, that's what Canada did, and then it open, and then it closes during the spawn, and then opens for for catch and keep or tournament season, whatever. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, for the viewers that are not aware of this. There's two counties in upstate New York that are right in prime smallmouth country. So Jefferson and St. Lawrence County actually has a rule where you cannot target bass, can't even go out and attempt to catch one. I believe it's December early December through the third week in June. And unfortunately, you know, it, it guys that catch and release on a regular basis or all the time, they're not allowed to go out there and it gets frustrating. And of course the third week in June, a lot of times in that region, because it is a colder water fishery, there's still a lot of fish on beds and everybody's itching to get out that weekend. And a lot of fish end up uh, being taken home and and uh, <laughs> made a fish fry, basically, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Yeah. And, and it's nice now that at least Canada's looking forward to you know possible solutions to that, and hopefully you know these two counties in upstate New York at some point will come around to a, a strictly catch and release season. And you're, you're right. You know, Lake Ontario for me this year was, was a little scary. What's happening out there. I would love to talk about, you know, we haven't talked about it yet on this, on this podcast, but the charter boats out there and we're not talking, you know, guys out in a bass boat, right. Guiding it's, uh, I call them the tuna boats, right? So it's, yeah, there's, it's, I think they're salmon boats is salmon kind of guys boats. that'll do multi-species. Yeah, so when the salmon bite's not happening, you know, it's the brown trolling for browns in the spring and and whatnot, and there's a little bit of time in between. Uh they'll they'll have five, six group of of people that go out and a lot of these guys don't really I don't think they even know what they're getting themselves into. You know, you yeah. and I would never hire a, a salmon boat to take us <laughs> bass fishing, right? We like our no. electronics, our trolling motors and artificial baits yeah but no live throwing, crabs <laughs> yeah they're throwing out crayfish and and setting up on these on these uh steep breaks and basically catching anything and everything and of course with live bait they're swallowing that bait and you know people that may not catch bass a lot are super excited and they man throw that fish in the cooler and they actually advertise a uh, a shore lunch. I mean, I call it the killing fields on Galoo Island. There, <laughs> uh, they'll pull up, and they have a bunch of picnic tables set up, and they'll pull up their their tuna boats and and go to town on filleting those smallmouth. And it's unfortunate. I don't I don't know if they realize the damage that they're doing, but yeah, dude, I've seen them go out when they get set up deep. I've seen them go out and pull up on a break or a hump or whatever and they'll make a morning trip from like 7 to 11 and they'll have four or five people on board they're keeping five fish per person so they're taking 20 25 30 fish whatever mm -hmm. take those people in i mean and they're they're bringing them over the side as fast as you could possibly drop a, a crawdad down hook one and reel it in and net it and then they're doing it again yeah. and they'll take those people in at 11 come back out an hour later at noon with a fresh group and take 20 more of them yeah. out of the same school. I mean, that's in, and there's dozens of them doing it every day. Like that's not sustainable. If you're going to protect anything, protecting the spawn is important. I, I want to see them protect the spawn. I want to see them protect the spawn on Champlain because what we're doing with tournaments there is not a sustainable platform. I mean, that can't be good for that lake. And um, this is worse though. I mean, 
we're at least keeping the fish alive generally on Champlain. Taking them off their beds is is it can't be good. There's nobody who can say otherwise with gobies in the water. But these guys are just killing them. The breeding mm-hmm. fish, the big fish, you know, fish that we need to reproduce, they're just killing them. Yeah. To no I, limit. No, no, it's you know, you gotta think there's a there's a solid dozen of these charter boats. And so if they do go two times a day, you know, that's 40 times a dozen. That's yeah. a big number of fish I, that, that get killed. I think, I think what they need to do is say, you can keep 10 per boat, right? Like if you want to go out and, ki- and catch fish and keep them fine, I think everybody should have that, right? But 10 per boat, right? Whether you got two people or you got 22 people and that, that should make a happy medium for both, right? Like they right. can go out. They, what are you, what are you going to do with twenty two dead with twenty dead smallmouth? You right. can't possibly eat that many. It's disgusting. Number one, and you like you could feed an army with that. Mm-hmm. So let them keep ten, right? If people want to go out and they want to catch some smallmouth, keep them, eat them. I don't feed them to cows. I don't care. Do whatever you want to do. You get ten. And that allows a tournament to go out with two anglers in the boat and we can put 10 in our live wells as well. So I think that's fair. You know, I don't think you're going to do any damage Mm -hmm. as not as much anyways, if you're only taking 10 out of their day, I still don't want to see it at all, but I understand that it's something that people have a right to do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's sad because you'd think that they would understand, you know, from their standpoint, their livelihood as well. Yeah, but, well, they don't care because as soon as the smallmouth die, they'll go to walleye or they'll go to salmon and sure. they, they just don't, or they'll go in the yeah. river. They don't and care. They, they do love getting real close to you when you're out there on the ledge. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll hear that diesel engine boom, 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 <laughs> look out 20 feet from me. Oh yeah. But, but how many times have you been sitting on a school or think you just found a school and that diesel engine pulls up and you go, they're here. I know yeah. they're here and I know they're sure. staying here because these boys know they're here. <laughs> sure. Well, there's a good tip, guys. If you are not familiar with Ontario and you want to go catch a few fish, just follow the charter boats around. Get as close as you can. Close as you can to them. Yeah, piss them right off. Right, right. Now, it is what it is. It needs to be addressed. I'm glad we brought it up here. There's nothing, you know, I don't know what the solution is. Hopefully, they'll get smart and realize. And really, I think it 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 starts with educating the the clients, letting them you know, I wish they knew how fragile of a fishery and how old these fish are before they decide to throw them in the cooler. But enough of that. It's uh, hopefully, hopefully things will will change around. But you're right. There's a there's a little bit of uh, 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 I guess I don't know what you would call it, but a decline, I guess, in the fishing on Lake Ontario from what I've seen uh, this past year. Maybe it's because they all went to Canada and we can't quite go to Canada. That's, I'm keeping my fingers <laughs> crossed. I'm hoping that's the reason. Uh, but Casey, what do you think your biggest strengths are when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Like, what are you like super confident? If you know they're on this technique, you have, you, you're just feeling good when you're out there fishing. I would say it's, if I can see them on my electronics, then I feel mm-hmm. good. If I can get out in the lake and they're deep. So maybe Maybe just call it deep water. If they're out where you can graph them, where you can see them, um, maybe not even have to see the fish. If you can just see the structure they're on, um, you know, they're on big boulder veins or rock veins in the grass. And I can see that stuff and pick that stuff out. Um, then that's, that's 100% what I feel most comfortable doing. I love when you can go to a tournament and graph over something and go, I'm going to catch one right there. That's what mm-hmm. I feel comfortable with. Sure. So preparing for these events, do you, do you, and you want to fish deep, you know, it's the right time of year and conditions are set up for you. What goes, what goes on in your mind when you're out there looking for these fish? Are you, are you fishing past history? Are you looking for new areas? How much time do you spend searching for these, these fish? And what can you expect to find after a day of, I guess, graphing, if you will? Um, I would say for your last question first, I would say if you're in a tournament scenario, me and you are out, we're fishing a Costa series event or bass open or something. If I spend a day graphing and I find one or two schools, I'm, I'm happy with it, to be honest. I mean, I'm not finding 20 or 30 schools just cause I'm sitting behind a steering wheel for six hours of a 10 hour day or whatever. I mean, 
as long as I can find something, a couple schools um, that I feel like are going to stay put, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, as far as fish in history versus fish in new water, I mean, for me, we've had, we've had so many big tournaments, pro level, you know, triple A pro level tournaments and up in this, in this um, region lately that I, I'm so familiar with the water that I, I have to fish water that's history at some point sure. because I've been to these places so many times and I use the history to kind of break down, Hey, you know, are they deep? Are they shallow? Are they, you know, biting moving baits? You got to drop shot them. Uh, and then from there I expand out. I make sure that every single time I look for new water, mm-hmm. but I definitely use history as my hub where, where I'm building out from there. If I have an area on Lake Champlain and St. Albans Bay that I know it's always holding fish and I go up there and those fish are there. Well, then I'll just build out from there and look at new water, look at more subtle stuff, look at sneakier stuff Mm -hmm. and, and use a combination of both. And I like that. I mean, that's what the local advantage is about is knowing if I need a bite, I can go here and get it. You know, I don't think you ever want to depend on that your local history, your local advantage, but that's, that's the local advantage is when you need a bite, I can go here and get it. When I need a big one, I can go here and get it. If I caught 17 pounds, you know, and I need to get up to 20, I can go here to increase my chances of that. So sure. Sure. I mix it all in. Yeah. That, that makes some, that makes some good, you know, make some good points as far as locating those fish on past history. You know, that's something I do when I'm all offshore deep. A lot of times I try to I try to find new stuff and it seems like I, I never can. You know, it's always sometimes yeah. that, that old history that, you know, there's a reason why those fish kind of gravitate to those zones. But when you're looking for new stuff, what are you looking for ideally when it comes to deep water fishing? When we're talking deep, I mean, what, 18 feet plus, you know, what's What's the typical zone when you're fishing the Great Lakes looking for deep fish for you? Yeah, I mean, deep for me, I would say is 20 or 25 or more. You know, I'd say 15. I wouldn't call that deep by any mm-hmm. means, even though you can be offshore. Um, I would Let's call it offshore rather than deep. Sure. But um, I would say um, what I'm looking for is irregularities, right? Like that irregularity might be different on Oneida versus Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence river. It's different than it's, it is on Erie or Oneida. Um, I was telling, I was talking to my brother about this the other day, he was going to Cumberland for the, um, coast of championship. And he's like, you know, this place is all rock. What am I looking for? And I said, different rock than what, what the rest of the rock is. So if I go to Ontario and, and I'm looking deep and it's a big gravel flat, then I want, I want the bigger boulders. I want the you know, the bigger rock, or if it's all flat slate rock, then I want the broken edges of it where it's rubble or, or boulders sitting on it, boulder veins have been deposited, you know, sitting on top of the flat rock. If it's Oneida, you know, and it's a lot of grass, then I want um, a different kind of grass or, or grass with rock mixed in it, something like that. So same with, same with Champlain, Champlain and Oneida are very similar. So Mm -hmm. any irregularity is all I'm looking for. And once I find it, then it's just about finding more of it or, or similar irregularities or other irregularities in similar places. Sure. Sure. I want to touch base because we haven't brought up the Finger Lakes and I know you do really well there. Uh, You know, I, and now it's, it's a mixed bag there a lot of times. Is there a particular finger lake that you have in mind that puts out a better bag of smallmouth that when you know you go to that lake, you might want to take a look at those fish over largemouth? Or is it or are the finger lakes pretty much dominated now by largemouth? Uh no. There it's it's very seasonal, definitely. And what makes what makes the smallmouth seasonal there is the bait. And we have alwives in every single, I think in every single finger lake around here. And it makes the fish very pelagic. Um, there's not a lot of good structure, right? Like you look at a map of Shamo Bay or Galoo Island and there's humps and points and they're in the right depth, you know, 20 to 40 feet, whatever. We, it's not that on the Finger Lakes. They're just big, huge bathtubs that 
come out off the bank and you know small slope to six or eight feet of water and then it just drops down into some of them 40 feet some of them 400 feet and sure. there's not a lot of room there it's such a narrow swath that any structure for those that those fish want to live in in the summer <clears throat> say 20 to 40 feet there's just not a lot there so um that combined with with the chasing the bait fish is what makes it a totally different fishery and once those fish get done spawning they'll hang out over those deep breaks and bust bait for a week or two while they recover and then they're gone see you in october really so um, it doesn't pay to even really target smallmouth no um i mean they're you just can't stay one. on top of them you know consistent yeah it's, it's a moving target number one i mean i wouldn't even know where to look because it's not like some of the other you know salmon type fishing where the bait stays in a general basin or something like mm -hmm. that it it's just completely gone there's nothing for it to hover over it's featureless out there it's not like you have 150 feet of water and there's a hump that comes up to 100 and the bait will hover over it they're just they're it's just gone completely gone right. so mm -hmm. i mean i've heard stories of guys that troll for lake trout and stuff catching the random big smallmouth out there sure. and maybe with new sonar technology someone will be able to do it but if you do it yeah you know, number one you better keep it quiet and number two i mean people are going to know because you're going to be bringing in probably giant bags of smallmouth in a time of year when sure. no one's weighing a smallmouth in uh, i mean the the limited times i've been on the finger lakes you know with the electronics i have on my boat i figured man this will be easy you know i'll be able to yeah. go offshore and find them you know 40 minutes into it, I'm back on the, uh, the, the grass at edge. You yeah. Know? I mean, I, I thought, so I, I got some new technology this fall, same stuff you have. And, and I figured this fall when the fish came in, not only could I catch the fish that were in, you know, along the breaks and the drops, but I figured you'd be able to look out and see some of those random rogue fish swimming out there, pelagic fish that were just close enough to where you could see them. And, it didn't really happen. So sure. they're, they're just tricky suckers, man. They, mm -hmm. they follow that bait around and they're gone. And, and you can see it in those fish when you catch them, you know, especially in the fall, they're long and they got big eyes on them. They're lean. They're not those fat goby eaters that don't have to travel far. Like they look like a sure. tuna almost with a big, huge marble eye in them. Right. Right. So I imagine the fall bite though, when they do start to get grouped up in schools and, and more predict predict you know areas you can predict they'll be in it's got to be a blast on those lakes yeah it's that time of year they come in they're aggressive they haven't seen a bait i mean they they really never see a bait compared to a gunnersville or anything it's not like you can say fishing pressure has any effect on those fish i don't think anyways not not much mm -hmm. um so they come in they're fresh they're green they're dumb they're hungry the water temperature's right and most importantly, they're ridiculously predictable. They come back to the same areas just year after year after year and sit there and they're just waiting for you. <laughs> sure. So and we, we a big tournament around here in the fall is 20 or 25 boats. There's not, I mean, I'm talking fall, like November, November. December, yeah. yeah, late October. There's a group of hardcore dudes that is going to be out there every week, but you're sure. not seeing a BFL or anything like that come through here. That's for sure. Right. What would be your beta choice that time of year in that, that fall bite on the finger lakes? What are you throwing? Uh, swim baits or a rigs, something like sure. that. I mean, a lot of guys like to catch them on a Ned rig, but I like to keep moving a little more than that covering ground. I mean, they're, they're just so dumb that you shouldn't really need to sit there and finesse them. Hmm. You, you can just move on and find, find something else. So I, I love a swim bait bite anyway. So I'm, I'm starting right. with that every single time. Sure. Yeah. You've done, uh, you've, you've done well with swim baits in the past. Speaking of swim baits, is this a, a, a swim bait is something you're probably throwing on all these different bodies of water in upstate New York? Yeah. And is, the, is it year round at all? Do you, do you find yourself using the swim bait in the summertime? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I got one on year round. I mean, sometimes it's a little 2.8, sometimes it's a 4.8, you know, size four inch, five inch. Um, sometimes it's an A rig there's five of them on one line. So, uh, I, I keep it on all the time. I don't use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And like I was telling you earlier, I'm definitely 
starting to trend a lot more finesse than I have in the past. So I'm depending on it a lot less, but it's on, it's on the front deck all the time. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we kind of mentioned your favorite technique, deep water fish, but what's your favorite time of year? Fall, fall or winter. Fall. Yeah. I, I would say when they get set up where they're going to sit for the winter or start to get close and they're deep and they're, you know, you can catch them on those, those type of moving techniques or a little more power techniques. We catch them on a football jig here too in the fall a lot, which is a riot. Mm -hmm. Um, so those, those techniques are, are just a blast and they just sit there for weeks on end and just pillage them. Sure. So when you're throwing the football jig, can you kind of walk us through a, a bait that you would pick up as far as size and how, you know, what type of trailer you would use and where you're throwing this football jig more often yeah, I, than not? I keep two of them on. I keep, um, like a smaller micro football jig, you know, like the, Ike, the I think I Elliot makes one Kai tech makes one Picasso makes one. Any of those small profile ones, like a half ounce. Um, and then I'll put like a three inch Berkeley chigger craw on it or something like that. Okay. Maybe one of those baby pocket craws. And then the other one I keep is a three quarter ounce full size football a, jig. A big one, um, full size weed guard and everything. Big full hook. size weed guard. Yep. Like you throw on a ledge on Kentucky Lake and I'll put same thing on that. Usually a chigger craw is what I use a three inch, sometimes a four inch. I don't know. I have no rhyme or reason to when I do one or the other, but, um, I don't know what makes them do it, but some lakes around here, maybe it's just our history, you know, of good days on it or something, but we'll, we'll throw that big one. I mean, and, and you need that big one to get down in 30 feet or more. That little one just takes forever. And if the so, wind is blowing, it's so a 30 feet, are you three quarters or you get I'm away three with quarters, yeah. three quarters. Yeah. So I'm three quarters, anything over like 30 feet, 25, 30 feet. And then I'll use that little one, you know. I'll use, I mean, I'll use it as shallow as they'll go, but sure. um, it's more of a weight thing to try and get it down there deeper. Is it more of a drag and stop, a continuous uh, hopping? What, what's your uh, cadence? Yeah, small. I wouldn't call it a drag. I mean, I hop it a little bit, but it's not, you know, you're not stroking it by any sure. means. So just little bumps along the bottom and feeling your way around for rock. And if you're a little shallow or any grass that's down there or deadhead log that's just stuck in the bottom. Mm -hmm. whatever just feeling your way around sure man yeah good stuff so what, what i asked this with everybody on on this podcast i want to know what your personal best smallmouth is size wise um i think it's 691 i've never broke seven i've had a bunch of them like right in that 690 range or six pounds 14 ounces six pounds 15 right around there i big think fish. I think the biggest one was in a um, uh, tournament you fished, cash in tournament a couple of years ago. I think it was okay. a 691 in that tournament. Sure. Can you walk us through that, you know, how you caught that fish? What, what were the conditions and the bait that you used? Fit, go figure. It was a swim bait fish. Um, we uh, it was super windy that day, and we just ran down to an area that um, – you know, we catch them. It's one of those areas there in year after year. And we ran down and um, pulled in. We made a few stops before that. We had we had a decent bag of fish, you know, 18, 20 pounds, something like that. And uh, knew they were in, you know, 15 feet of water, 20 feet of water and could catch them on a swim bait. So uh, we pulled into this area and they were in there and they were big ones. And it was, uh, I think it was like a 3.8 uh kai tech i caught okay. that one on quarter sure. ounce head something like that three eighths ounce head and mm -hmm. just went through it one time and one time through we had like 25 pounds it was just big ones in there and picked up and went back through and called up and had 26 or 27 and went back through and i don't remember what the exact weight was that day but it was like right around 28 and a half 29 and a half pounds something like that it was just under 30 and sure. we left at like 11 o'clock and ran back back yeah to take it off just I, rem sure. I remember that day <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was uh yeah i was glad to be back at the ramp safe <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll yeah you had a rough go yeah so when, when you caught that fish did you know it was that big i mean how no, was the dude. mood in the boat did you have you said you had a limit you're fighting this fish so yeah. what happens when you realize man that you got like almost a seven pound smallmouth on right now yeah i mean when you're catching them and they're all that big you like you lose your perspective on you know, what's a five and a half and what's a six and a half just goes out the window. I mean, you know, 
yeah, it's more than a four pounder, but you know, you throw out there and thing goes to the bottom and you start winding it back in and just boom, you set the hook and it's just dead weight on there. And you're like, okay, uh -huh. I, I got a freaking big one on. And then he comes up, but he's a mile out there. So you sure. can't tell, you know, you know, he's a freaking big one. He looks like a blimp, but mm -hmm. and he gets in the net. I think, I think, um, when my buddy Dukes netted it, it sat in the floor of the boat. And I was like, dude, how big is that thing? Like, right. I mean, is it six? Is it seven? Is it eight? I don't know how big it is, but it's freaking bigger than any other one I've ever caught. So yeah, I don't know, dude. I don't, I don't get, I don't get those bites a lot. I don't feel like I don't get those. Like I don't win lunker a lot. I don't go out and catch, you know, like in on Cayuga in the spring, I'll go out there for weeks on end and never catch one over seven. And then like some, like you, you'll show up right. and you'll catch an eight pounder. Yeah. And I just don't, I don't know why I get those. I don't know if it's because, um, like I look for fish differently than people or those big ones are a little more loners. A lot of times, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times guys stumble on those really, really big fish sure. like that sure. and they're not in those massive schools. Cause it, I think it takes so much bait to feed those big fish that they can't live together with very many of them. Mm. Yeah. So that, think, that, that makes sense. I, yeah, it's it's a funny story uh, for everyone that's listening. We so back in August of last year, I was on Cayuga, which I don't have a whole lot of experience, and I was just messing around, not doing, not knowing what I was doing, just hanging out in the grass edge, and I caught a freaking eight pounder, <laughs> and I was like, wow, I was like, okay, that's cool, and uh, I talked to you later on that day, and I go, so what, what's like normally big fish like, you know. I just call it like an eight. Is that pretty common? Like I had no uh, idea. Is that, is that good? Is that good? <laughs> eight pounder good in New York state? And you're like, uh, well, yeah, there's not too many eights weighed in <laughs> lately. <laughs> yeah, I haven't two, I, right, seen right. whoever, and they were caught off the same dock and they were probably the same bass. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That was a, not a caught truly, by me. That was truly a giant fish. And like it, it's just, you know, you luck into, you, you do it long enough. You get one here, one there. Yeah. But uh, you know what I mean? I think those fish live a little more. I'm not, I'm just busting your balls, but I think, uh, like a lot of times when guys come in, you know how it is. You fish a little tournament around home or something, and someone weighs in a freak fish like that, but they've got like three fish or eleven pounds, but one of them's eight eight pounds. You know, sure. and it's just like, wait a minute, how you know how did you catch that? Well, it's just a a big random one by itself. I think I don't think a hundred of those fish can live together. I don't I don't know what else it would be because. I've caught a hell of a lot of smallmouth bass and I've never caught one over seven pounds. And I don't right. know, that's the excuse I'm going to tell myself anyways. Other than no, that, I, stuck, mean, I don't know if, if anyone spends a lot of time on these bodies of water that have these giants, it's you. And so it's rare. It's special to be honest with, with everyone that's listening, when it comes to the great lakes, you can expect, and you should expect, you know, some five pound fish when you're in the right zone and possibly a six, but when you get over that six pound mark, that's just, those are freaks, you know, yeah. they're there yep. and there's a lot of them there. It's just, it, it's hard. You hear 30 pound bags coming in on a regular basis on the great lakes, mm -hmm. you know, a six pound average is there for the taking, but that seven, seven and a half, eight pound average, it's not really, it's unheard of, but there's five, eight pounders swimming around right now on the great lakes yeah. on every great lake yeah there, there there is like look at the springtime every year when you get one of those right springs where it's a little cold and maybe there's a canadian open or something with a bunch of really good guys going out of the st lawrence or there was a college tournament a couple of years ago when they hit that spawn right on opening weekend and it was in a peak like we mm -hmm. hit the spawn a lot of times on opening weekend but it's past its peak when those really big ones are done and they hit it perfect or those Canadian tournaments will hit it perfect sure. and there's multiple 30 pound bags or a 32 or something. So they're in there. There's plenty of them in there because everyone will have 27 or 28 pounds. But then when they they're done with that and they move out, those big fish are doing something different than four pounders because a 20 pound bag is not uncommon in the summertime, but 30, you catch a 30 pound bag in the summertime in Ontario, you're I don't, you're doing something ridiculous. I agree. Yeah, that's it's rare that time of year for sure. If you could use one bait for the rest of your life, 
Well, let's not go that far. Just for next year. Mm -hmm. One bait for smallmouth. What would that bait be? Well, based on the way we've talked about everything, the easy answer would be a swim bait. Um, right. And it would probably made it sound like I depend on that a lot more than I do. That being said, my answer is a net rig, I think. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, it, a net rig and a small swim bait are very similar, but I think in the summertime they do eat that better than a swim bait. And you can fish it from literally, you could skip a dock with it if you really wanted to, but smallmouth wise, you could fish it in five, six foot of water around shallow rock and you could, you can throw it really deep. You can drop it vertical like a drop shot. You can, I mean, I don't know, you could probably swim in if you wanted to. I don't know how much you'll catch, but sure. um, you can do anything you want with it really. And it's, it's so versatile. A, a, like a three inch swim bait would probably be in the same category for me. I got one of those on all the time too. All the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Particular color. If you had to choose one on a Ned yes. or a three inch swim bait, a Ned, a Ned. Ned, just a green pumpkin turd. Green pumpkin's your color. Yeah. 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 Pretty simple. It's, I think the one I use all the time has like a little purple and gold flake in it. I don't know what they call it. Mud bug. Yeah. No. Mud bug. Maybe. I don't know. You know, more uh, than me. it's that, uh, it's the Gobi. They don't call deal. it Gobi. Do they? Sure. They do. Is it called Gobi? Oh uh, yeah. Green pumpkin. I, I got a pack right here for everybody. <laughs> this is probably the one you're talking about. So sorry for the guys. Sorry for the viewers that are watching or listening. Yeah, man. Is that it? It's a little crooked. Yep. Yeah. Very effective bait for yep. sure. Yeah. I can't argue that. I, it would be right up there if I had only ch it, throw one bait. Stupid, right? But it, it's effective. It's, it works. And like yeah, you said, you can fish it in every water column every situation that you can can think of and they suck that thing down man yeah, they it's just i mean anywhere anytime the grass is probably it's one downfall i i don't have a good rigging option for it in the grass i know guys are starting to use it on those um texas rig net heads or whatever but i i don't know i don't really like it i'm gonna throw something else probably in that scenario sure yeah totally understandable What's your like most exciting way to catch them as far as a bait goes? Like, like, are, are you, uh, I, I know you're big into blade baits at times. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you love throwing a jerk bait, Alabama rig, top water. I mean, there's so many options. It's I don't know, dude. I don't give a crap. Them. Whatever they're going to bite. I really, right? I like sure. it. Honestly, I like it. I, again, we talked a lot about swim baits and stuff, but I love a drop shot bite, especially, you know, I mean, vertical one, casting it. I don't care what it is. Um, I like to get on the St. Lawrence and drag a Ned rig or drag a, drag a drop shot. I like when that thing, you can't feel that bite and it just gets like a rubber band and you pull up on it and it's just, you know, dead weight. It takes a mm -hmm. second to figure out if it's the bottom or a bass. I like I like in the fall when they hit a, uh, a rig so hard that we call it the push bite at home. Like they hit it so hard that it just – you just lose all feeling. I mean, you got a two ounce harness on there between the weights and the mm -hmm. contraption and the swim baits. And they hit it so hard from behind or up. I don't know which way they're coming at it, but it just loses all weight and you just know he's on there and you got to reel down to set into him. I like that. Sure. I, I'm probably not a big top water guy. I'm not a top water guy at all. I, I don't know, dude, I just struggle with it. So it's fun. I like it, but um, I'm I suck with top water. So, sure. well, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen everywhere on every body of water. Like some people, you know, that may not be used to New York, upstate New York fishing. Uh, there's certain bodies of water. It seems that they keep more in more on uh, a top water bite than others. There's even Great Lakes differ. You know, from Lake Michigan to Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, every section of those Great Lakes has a different, I guess, top water bite, if you will. And some are non-existent. You know, I can count mm -hmm. probably on two hands, the number of uh, fish I've caught on Lake Ontario on a top water. Yeah. You know, I know it can be done. Guys do it. Mm -hmm. I'm probably in the same boat as you. I just don't, I don't pick that up as often as maybe I should mm -hmm. or, you know, don't have the confidence. But now if I'm on Champlain, I probably would have one. It's just like, it's not like, to me, 
a bass, especially a smallmouth that's going to bite a topwater, is going to bite a swim bait. He's going to bite a jerk bait. He's going to bite something else. Like he doesn't have to go on top. Like in the south in the fall, those bass, like these coastal championships, me and you have fished, especially on Gunnersville or Kentucky Lake, like those get dominated by topwater because for whatever reason, those fish will bite a topwater, but they won't bite a swim bait or a chatter bait as well. Hmm, Smallmouth yeah. don't seem to get like that. They seem like he's not going to swim by a swim bait. You know, he's going to bite it and sure. you don't need a topwater to get him to bite. And then you throw, for me, then you throw in the factor on top of it. You don't need it and to get the strike. When you get the strike, he may or may not get it. And then you get those days when, okay, it cooled down three degrees, water temperature cooled down three degrees. Are they not going to come up for it anymore? Mm -hmm. um, or it's cloudy instead of sunny or it's sunny instead of cloudy. So are they not going to come up anymore? You just wipe those factors right out when you don't have to worry about it. So that's, I, that's why I just, I don't even mess with it usually. I mean, sometimes on Champlain or Oneida, especially if I'm fun fishing or you're mm -hmm. getting a bunch of bites, I'll throw it on, but I don't, yeah. I don't mess with it. Sure. No, I understand. What do you think separates you, Casey, from, you know, there's a lot of good smallmouth anglers out there. What makes you so successful when it comes to smallmouth fishing? What's your, you know, why are you who you are? Who am I? I don't <laughs> Most know. People probably aren't even going to know. <laughs> uh, um, probably putting in work. Uh, that probably is what does it. I love to sit at the steering wheel and look, you know, um, graph around and experiment. I like to do stuff that's maybe not normal stuff. Um, look at something a little deeper. Look at something a little shallower. Uh, maybe try a technique that's, I don't know, a largemouth technique or something different. Um, I like to, to do that. I, I like to sit there and find little uh, subtleties that no one else is going to find, little rocks in the grass that no one else is going to graph over and see or, or look for them at times of the year. People aren't going to look for them. Um, and, and so I would say, I mean, a lot of my, res my tournament success is in this part of the country where I have that history and that time on the water that people come in into this area and they don't have. So I'm at a huge advantage because I've got that seat time. I've got that history. I've got year after year of going there and seeing, um, you know, uh, consistencies and patterns and stuff like that. Um, so I think that, and then I think one thing I really understand is, uh, fish migration, especially smallmouth. I know what makes them migrate. I think I know where they like to migrate. I think I know what types of lakes they migrate on and they don't migrate as much on. So I, I think those two things are what gives me an advantage anyways, over a lot of other people that smallmouth fish. Well, Casey, that was some really good stuff. I, I know a lot of our listeners are going to be able to pick up a few tips, especially if you're thinking about fishing in the upstate New York area, the Great Lakes, all the great inland lakes, the Finger Lakes. I mean, like you said, you're living in like the capital of smallmouth fishing in the country. And uh, I mean, that's awesome. I, I, I can't wait till I can get up there permanently someday and experience all that on a regular basis like yourself. Where can people follow you uh, as far as social media if they want to? follow you next year. I, I believe you're jumping into the, the Northern opens in 2021. Yeah, I'm going to try to get into the Northern opens and, uh, keep things moving. I took, uh, I've been fishing the Northern coasts for four or five years. I don't know how long it's been. And, uh, this year with the schedule changes and all that, I just took a step back and started a little business at home and saved some vacation at work. And I got to fish more locally too. I mean, it, it's nothing that sucks more than you know, such a short season, you don't get to capitalize on all these good fisheries we have around here. You're going to the Potomac in August for a tournament. And it's going to suck and be a grind. You're not going to catch anything. And, you know, at home, they're just on fire, you know, on the lake or they're grouped up deep here or there. And right. um, so, yeah, this year I took a step back and it was a huge refresher um, to get some things settled. And, you know, I want to fish a lot more. I want to fish, um, more tournaments, more parts of the country. And, 
couple of the moves I made this year with starting a little business and making a few changes at work and home, uh, hopefully you're going to allow that. So I'm going to jump into the opens next year and see where that goes. So it's a good schedule and, uh, it's New York based. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a great schedule. So how can they follow you on social media? And then is, uh, you know, is anyone as far as sponsorship or anyone going to help you in, in 2021? Uh, working on a few things sponsor wise, probably nothing that, uh, is ready to come out. I do work with Sims pretty closely. I got a Sims deal and I want to thank those guys. They're good gear for this part of the country. Um, but as far as following me, um, I got a Facebook account. It's just a regular page, but, uh, probably Instagram is better. It's, uh, at Casey Smitty. There's a Casey Smith fishing out there. Right. Dang. That's Don't not you me. Hate that when that happens, yeah, that's not me. People see your name, and my grandma followed him for like a <laughs> long time and thought it was me. <laughs> right? That's funny. And then she she asked me about a uh, dude was working at the Bassmaster Classic or something like that, and uh, my grandma was over like a couple weeks later. <laughs> She's like, uh -huh. "I saw you were at a trip in Alabama somewhere. How was your trip?" I'm like, "What funny. the hell are you talking about?" <laughs> She's like, "Well, this is you on social media, right?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> wrong one not me <laughs> so uh at at casey smitty is my instagram i don't know i should probably fire up a facebook fishing page or something but um something i'm no small mouth crush of social media so i hear you I you hear gotta you. bear with my layman's social media it's all good well i wish you best of luck i'm sure i'll see you uh hopefully we get into the opens you can do some damage in yeah man New York i appreciate year. you having me on it's good talking to you yeah, yeah. Good job sure. with the new podcast, dude. It's Thank cool. You. I like Looking it. You're hustling. Yeah, You're we're hustling. trying, man. Top guys around the country. It's going to be a good one. So no. I appreciate everybody listening. And as always, until next time, I mean, how do you end this? I don't know. We'll see you on the water. <laughs> All right. See you. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.